So the new Chard Walls of the Damned album comes out on September 23rd. What can fans expect from that album? Is there anything different in that album as opposed to the the first two albums? Well, you know, we we don't try to stray too far from from what we do, and uh, we want people to kind of know what they what to expect when they hear Chard Walls of the Damned. But at the same time, I think um, something that, that we made sure is really good on the new albums. We got those big, catchy, sing-along kind of choruses in the songs, and the songs are real compact and pretty to the point on the new album, so I think you can expect to just bang your head and have fun and, and you know, enjoy a good slab of metal with the new album. And uh, But also there's, you know, there's the technicality, there's the, some crazy drum stuff and some crazy guitar stuff, and of course, Steve Giorgio on bass does some wild stuff. And then uh, with Tim Owens, he did something on the new album that uh, I don't think he did on the last two where he does these couple of screams where he goes from a, a death metal growl into this crazy high scream. And I think it sounds about like the, the most metal thing of all time. So uh, I can't wait for people to hear that as well. So it's just, uh, you know, when it comes down to it, it's just a good uh, good metal album considering you guys have members in other bands i mean you have steve DiGiorgio, you have tim ripper owens how do you guys manage to take care of the whole album process like from the songwriting to recording to doing the promotional stuff how do you guys fit that into your schedules well you know the a lot of the reason that that i mostly write all the music and also write the lyrics is just because those guys are so busy with their other projects. Tim is, is uh, you know, he has his solo band and Beyond Fear and, and his other bands that he tours with. And and same with Steve DiGiorgio. He's been touring with Death Doll and also he's on the New Testament album and touring with them. And then Jason Sukoff is really busy as a producer and, and with his studio, Audio Hammer Studios in Florida. So... I kind of take care of the, the songwriting and, and the lyrics and, and the bulk of everything and creating the demos so that those guys, when, when they're ready to do something, uh, it doesn't really take up a whole lot of their time. They're able to come in, do it, have fun, and, and you know, it's pretty, pretty easy for them. And just because uh, I know they're really busy and that. They have, you know, their, their jobs that they got to do. So I want this to just be a kind of a fun thing where they can come in. Um, you know, they still have total creative freedom where I tell them, hey, if any idea you have, let's do it. And But at the same time, I want to kind of have a pretty good template uh, when they come in so that it's just uh, it just makes it easier for those guys because I know their schedules are, are really, really busy. So is most of the recording done like, say, in Pro Tools, they they record a piece and then send it to you, or are you guys actually in the same room when it happens, or how does that work? No, yeah, we're all in, we're in the studio together, definitely. Uh, you know, we want this to be, uh, we don't want to piece it together. We want it to be, you know, a real album experience where we're all having fun and making music together. So um, I pretty much write all the music and, and demo everything and even sing vocal ideas to the on the demos but then jason sukoff and i'll get together for pre-production and he jason i'm just kind of a basic guitar player and bass player and i'm a horrible singer so <laughs> the demos are a very rough version of what the album's gonna end up sounding like and i tell Jason and Steve and Tim, just take my rough ideas and, you know, use them like a blueprint and just make them your own and make them way better because they're all way better at what they do than, than, I, than I can do on the demos. But when it comes to making the album, uh, we all fly into Audio Hammer Studios in Orlando, Florida. And we're, we're not always there at the same time, but I always try to be there with those guys. Um, and... You know, I wanted to, to really, you know, one of the best things about getting to make an album is just being in the studio with your buddies and having fun. So I just wouldn't feel 
like it was as much fun and, and and all that if we had to piece it together and mail in, you know, or do our parts over email or whatever. So I love that we're, we're able to, you know, thanks to Metal Blade and thanks to Brian Slagle, we're able to have a budget where we can record at a nice studio, uh, Audio Hammer Studios in Florida, where we can all fly in and, and be together and, and really create together. And uh, it's a really inspiring process, especially, you know, when we all are contributing ideas and, uh, and just being together to work on this to make the album awesome. And I think, especially this album, uh, we always try to get a really natural sound and a live sound. I mean, my my dream eventually would be is if we could all record the whole album live in the studio, but it takes a lot of time and just a lot of, uh, you know, it requires a pretty big budget to be able to do that. Uh, but we try to do that the best we can. And, you know, the drums, if I make a little bitty mistake, I'll end up leaving it in because I want it to sound human. And we just want this album to sound very natural and I, I think it definitely does how did you come up with a lineup for charred walls of the dam did it come from your time with death like or or how did that lineup come about oh uh, yeah absolutely well you know I, I always knew that jason sukoff was going to be a part of it because we've been jamming together since about 1999 when i met him in orlando uh he's just such an amazing Amazingly talented songwriter and guitar player and just a super fun guy to hang out with. He's got an awesome sense of humor. So Jason and I have actually been writing songs together since 99, and I always knew I wanted to do something with him. So we've kind of, this band has kind of been around in one form or another since 99 when Jason and I started writing music together and jamming. Uh, and then I was in Ice Earth with Tim, and we became really good friends, and I've always I've admired him as a singer since uh, Judas Priest. So uh, I knew when I was putting this band together that I, I definitely wanted to try and get him if he had the time to do it. And luckily, he did, and he was into doing it. And then Steve DiGiorgio, I met. He played on the demos for The Sound of Perseverance with Death, and I've been a huge fan of his since back in the '80s when he played in band Sadus. And then, of course, on the uh, Death albums that he played on, especially the the bass on Individual Thought Patterns, when that album came out, I freaked on the bass playing on that. And I was like, God, if I could ever jam with this guy, it'd be a dream come true. So uh, he's just a totally chill and cool guy as well. And, you know, that was a lot of it for me, too, was just not only did I want really good musicians, but I wanted guys where we could all get along and everybody was chill and mellow and, and, you know, we're all kind of older guys now, so we're just about having fun and playing some metal. I know that you've been in multiple bands at the same times at some point. Um, a f- mm-hmm. I'm guessing, like, last year or two years ago, there was talk about a Demons and Wizards album coming out. Is that still in the cards, do you know? Well, uh, you know, I'm not sure. I actually toured with them. Uh, 16 years ago in the year 2000, it was awesome. Uh, and I'm so bummed. I I almost had a chance to play on their very first album, the one that came out in the year 2000. Uh, for some reason or the other, I can't remember why it didn't happen, and I'm so bummed because I love that album. But I'm psyched that I got to tour uh, with them on that album. But, um, you know, since I moved to New York, I haven't... Uh, I haven't really, you know, been jamming with them or, or, or been in contact with them. So I'm not sure. I know they, they had that second album out, I think, about 10 or 11 years ago. But I, I haven't really heard anything about a third album. So I would love to hear it just as a fan. I don't think I would be a part of it just because my schedule's so crazy. But uh, as a fan, I hope they do another album. And I love, uh, you know, I had a blast turn with Ice Earth with John and... and with uh, Hanzi from um, Blind Guardian, too. I'm a huge fan of his vocals, so I I hope they do another album. How do you feel about being in such influential metal bands like Death and Iced Earth, and how do you feel about drummers listing you as an influence? Uh, Well, it's absolutely an honor. I, uh, you know, those are bands that I never would have dreamed I got to, to join. 
and it made all the, the hard work and all the thousands of hours that I spent practicing drums, it made it all worth it. And, uh, you know, and, and here, any drummer that would ever say that I'm an influence on them, I'm just honored by that. It's so cool. Uh, I love, uh, I'll go on YouTube once in a while and see people doing drum covers of, like, death songs from The Sound of Perseverance or a Charred Walls of the Dam song or an Ice Turf song. And it's like, it's just so cool to watch other drummers playing these drum parts that uh, that I came up with, and uh, it's very surreal. I, you know, because I never would have imagined 20 years ago that one day drummers would want to play stuff that I played, and so it's uh, it's really cool. And you know, I even wrote some of the lyrics for some of the charred walls of the dance songs. Are just about they're kind of my thank you to uh, drums to just for all the joy that playing drums has given me and uh, like the song Blood on Wood from our first album it's just about my love for playing the drums so uh, it's, it's been a lot of work I've been playing since 1984 and uh, especially when I lived in Florida I used to practice up to five or six hours a day so it's a lot of hard work but it definitely pays off when you hear of those people that uh, enjoy what I've done and I really really appreciate it when you were a kid, what made you decide to to pick the drums as opposed to, you know, the guitar or vocals? Uh, it was the song Hot for Teacher by Van Halen. When I I heard that song, it came out in 1984, and that was the year that they first offered band class at my grade school. And I heard that song, my neighbor Larry Bierbauer had it on vinyl, and he played it for me, and I was like, what is going on there? When I heard the drum part, I was like, I want to learn how to do something like that. And I remember when they asked me at band class in fifth grade what I wanted to play, I was like, drums. And uh, there were too many kids that wanted to be drummers. They had about uh, five spots for the drums and 10 different kids in our class wanted to be drummers. So they gave us a rhythm test. Uh, we had to almost audition to, to play drums in band class. And luckily, thanks to the fact that I had been playing for about a year on uh, buckets. I grew up on a farm, so I used to play with sticks on buckets. And I, I remember I used to play along the Quiet Riot Metal Health, and specifically the song Come On, Feel the Noise. I used to play that drum beat from that song. So luckily, I had a little bit of practice on drums. And, uh, I passed the audition to, to join the school band as a drummer, and uh, I just uh, I loved it ever since, and that was uh, 32 years ago. Uh, actually, thirty, almost exactly 32 years ago, because it was August of 1984 when, wow. I, uh, when I first started playing the drums. What do you think is the definitive metal album? Like, if you had to define heavy metal in one album, which album would that be? Number of the Beast by Iron Maiden. Um, because it, it has everything. It's got, uh, you know, the song Number of the Beast has the evil, scary lyrics. It's got the cool intro. Uh, it's catchy but heavy at the same time. It's got the guitar melodies, the double guitar melodies. Uh, it's got the killer artwork got the high screams uh it just has everything so i would definitely say iron maiden number of the beast is to me the definitive metal album all right i wanted to ask you about your time with death and control denied i read on wikipedia that chuck schuldner auditioned you alone in a room and could could you elaborate on that experience i know that you were a death fan before you auditioned yeah, I mean, I've been a Death fan since the late 80s. Um, I think the first album I ever heard was Spiritual Healing, and I loved it. But then uh, Death came out with the album Human after that. And when I heard that and I heard Sean Reinhardt's drumming, it just totally blew me away and changed my life. That, that album uh, really changed my life as far as being a drummer and hearing what he did on that album and hearing just how... That album is so heavy, but at the same time so melodic and so technical. 
that album was what I wanted to do musically uh, from then on. And, you know, I wanted to aspire to, to play that kind of music. So, you know, since, since probably 1991, around when the Human album came out, when I first heard it, I had been practicing to that album, trying to play it, and I never really got, was able to play it until years after, because it's such a difficult album to play on the drums. And then when uh, Individual Thought Patterns and Symbolic came out, uh, I was blown away right away by Gene Hoagland. I had been a fan of Gene Hoagland since Dark Angel, and uh, he came into death and was just incredible, especially uh, when I heard the song Symbolic, the double ride cymbal stuff that he does on that song is just insane. And it, I just spent months and months trying to learn how to do that. I remember when that album came out. So when the chance to audition for Death came in the summer of 1997, I, I was pretty prepared because I just practiced along the Death all the time anyway because I loved the music and I wanted to be as good of a drummer as Gene and as Sean. Uh, because they were two guys that I really admired, and I was aspiring to be as good as them. So, uh, thanks to uh, Rick Renstrom and B.C. Richards, who played in a band called Wicked Ways in Orlando, they were friends with Chuck. And I had met Chuck a couple times at shows, and he was always really, really nice. And uh, But they were really good friends with him and had his number, and they recommended me to Chuck to, for an audition. And, uh, yeah, I... I went to a rehearsal space in downtown Orlando and uh, met up with Chuck and, and set the drums up and we pretty much just ran through the whole Human album and he was very impressed and I told him, I said, you know, I've, I've been playing these songs for years and years and he could tell and a few days of jamming, he told me I had the gig and uh, I immediately called my parents and I said, you know who my favorite band is, right? And they said, yeah, Death. And uh, so I'm playing drums for him now, and they thought that was just so cool, and uh, they knew it was a dream come true for me. So just it, being a fan really had, had me prepared for the audition, even though I was very nervous. I, I was pretty confident because I just I loved those songs, and I knew them really, really well already. About the drumming on the sound of Perseverance, some of, I mean, it, it's insane, like, were there any Thank struggles you. when when you guys were recording, like in terms of, you know, the metronome or the syncopation? Like, what was there anything in particular that stood out during the recording process of that album? Um, you know, we actually didn't play to a metronome on that album. We and we were pretty lucky because we had been rehearsing those songs for almost a year before we recorded them. So. We knew those songs like the back of our hand. We just were so prepared. And, uh, you know, I, I remember being very nervous because it was my first time recording at Morris Sound. And Jim Morris was recording us, and he's a legend. And I, was, I remember being nervous, but super excited as well. And I remember uh, when we first played uh, uh, Scavenger of Human Sorrow, uh, and Jim, we went back in the control room after I played the drums, and Jim Morris looks at me and he goes, I, I got to be honest, I don't know what the heck is going on here. <laughs> he, just, he, he, just, he was so surprised at how crazy the drumming and, and just the, the time signatures of the song were that uh, he just looked, you know, he was kind of shaking his head, but he loved it. Uh, so it was really, uh, it was cool getting to see his reaction because he was pretty much the first person that had heard these songs besides the band. Right. And uh, I just remember we we didn't take very long to do the drums. I, I think we took a day or two. Um, and then we went out to celebrate after we finished the drums uh, to the restaurant, this restaurant called Carrabba's, uh, right near Morris Sound Studios. It's a chain Italian restaurant, but to this day, it's my favorite restaurant ever because I have such great memories of me and Jim Morris and Chuck going to Carabas to celebrate after uh, re finishing the drums for Santa Perseverance. And I remember uh, Jim Morris said, oh, you guys got to get the chicken brine. It's the greatest thing ever. And so to this day, chicken brine at Carabas is my favorite 
dish of all time, uh, you know, because it had such a sentimental value to me because it, it always made, you know, reminds me of that night when I finished the drums for Sound of Perseverance and I got to celebrate with Chuck and Jim Morris. So it only took two days pretty much to get all of that down. Yeah, I think two, maybe three days at the most. Um, and it, cause, but that's kind of how I am when I go in the studio. I don't like to overthink stuff. Um, I think you might even be able to hear a couple stick clicks on the perseverance. Because I was like, you know what? If it's uh, we we wanted it to sound really natural and sound like a live band playing, and I think it does sound like that. And uh, you know, I think we got that too because we recorded on two inch tape, and we didn't use a metronome, and so we really had to pretty much play it straight through without any mistake uh and you know these days you can kind of stop and start because of pro tools and if you have a metronome and all that but uh, i'm so proud of that album because we we didn't record with a metronome and we were just recorded pretty much like a live band and uh and i think it just sounds amazing and i i, I love I, one of my dreams is to one day you know be able to record on two inch tape again with charred walls of the end and and record as a full band live because uh that would be just amazing but it, it's hard to do these days just because of budgets and all that kind of stuff you were also in control denied with chuck i know that you finished one album with that band and that there was talk of a second album how much of it was already completed um, I did my drums in December of the year 2000, and uh, I'm really proud of the the drums on there, because those I did in one day. I did every track in one day, and uh, the drum sound was amazing, uh, and I really hope that people will get to hear it one day, and uh, Chuck did his guitar parts as well, and those are incredible as well, and I really hope, I remember Chuck and I, uh, and Shannon and, and Scott rehearsing that album. Or actually, I think at that point it was Chuck and Shannon and I and Steve DiGiorgio. And I remember rehearsing that album, and there's such crazy stuff on that second album that uh, we did this one thing where it didn't have a time signature. We would slow down just by looking at each other and then speed back up this one really weird riff and I remember when Chuck came up with it and showed it to me we were just all laughing because it was so crazy sounding and so cool and uh, I really hope people get to hear it I don't I don't have any news on it unfortunately but I still have my fingers crossed that one day people will get to hear that album um, you know we just the thing is we gotta make sure that it's something that Chuck would have uh, wanted people to hear and that that it's done right, so I really hope that, uh, that people get to hear it one day, because it's really an amazing album. Speaking about Chuck, were you ever involved with a Death DTA tour? Uh, I was, in a very small way. Um, the very first tour came through New York, and I think the first tour was actually just two shows. I think they did L.A. and then New York, and then I played two songs, and um, and it was amazing. I played Spirit Crusher and Scavenger of Human Sorrow, and um, I'm friends with um, uh, the guitar player from Testament, Alex Skolnick, and he agreed to learn the songs and play them with us, which was uh, incredible. So we uh, we did the show at Irving Plaza. I think it was 2011, maybe. Um, and uh, it was just awesome. It was the hottest show I think I've ever played because the air conditioning went out, and they were carrying people out on stretchers. It was so hot. And uh, people flew in from Europe to go to that show because at the time it was only, I think, two shows that were happening in America. So people were flying in from all over the world to go to it. So I got to do that. I, unfortunately, I had, just because of my schedule, I haven't got to do any of the other tours or anything, but I'm so glad that people are still able to hear Chuck's music and uh, that the musicians that, that played with Chuck are able to 
to go out and do these tours. I think that's such a cool thing. And I love, too, that Relapse is putting out the Death album. They're doing an amazing job with the re-releases. And uh, I think there's a Sound of Perseverance re-release coming out soon. And also, uh, I think it's coming out on vinyl, which uh, is going to be awesome. Speaking of scheduling and all that, would you ever rejoin Iced Earth if the time was right? Um, maybe. I mean, it's it's hard now because I live in New York City and they're based out of Indiana. But, uh, you know, I love the band and I still listen to them all the time. So, you never know. But, um, you know, it's just... I With my job now and, and living in New York City and all that kind of stuff, I... I think Charred Walls of the Damned works best for me just because it's kind of my my project and I'm able to, to, you know, decide our schedule and all that kind of stuff. Do you still work in electrical engineering? Uh, no, I, uh, I haven't in a while. I, you know, I, I remember a lot of it, but I got shocked a couple times. <laughs> actually, I was actually just an electrician. I wasn't an electrical engineer. I'm, I'm not that smart, but <laughs> uh, although I, I'm not even I'm not even sure what a, uh, an electrical engineer does. It sounds very, very, very high tech and too fancy for me. But uh, I was just a uh, you know a regular electrician, and I actually loved it. It was uh, it was a lot of fun. I I've made really good friends, uh, lifelong friends from doing that job, and. Uh, I love bending conduit, and uh, there's there's a certain art to it. Now, when I go to you know a store or something like a Walmart or something, I'll see how they did the electrical, and I'll admire it and I appreciate it. And but I haven't, you know, since I moved to New York, I haven't really done it. And I don't know that I could do it up here because it's so much more complex than when I was living in Florida. And uh, I think you have to be. You know, I have a certain kind of license and right. all that kind of stuff up here. But uh, but I'm glad I did it. You know, being a metal musician is not easy. I, I was never actually able to kind of pay the bills from just doing music. So I had my day job, too. But I consider myself very lucky that I was able to, to go on tour for a few months at a time while I was an electrician. And my boss was cool with it. So I had a really cool boss who would let me take off for like three or four months at a time. Um, but... Uh, yeah, it was kind of a culture shock to go from being on tour and playing in front of hundreds or, or thousands of people and then going back to bending conduit and getting shocked by 10 and 77 volts in a while. I wanted to ask you about your time with Howard Stern. Will you do any Cell and Richard prank calls again? Uh, yeah, we're still doing them. You know, I'm still there and... Uh, and I love it. It's all, it's my dream job. You know, I've been so fortunate that not only did I get to play in in these bands that I love, that now I'm working a job that I have always dreamed of having. So uh, yeah, we're still doing the prank calls, and, and, and it's amazing. I've been there twelve years now. And I, it's it's freaking awesome. Is there anything surprising about working with Howard Stern that the average listener would never guess about him? Like, just something um, random. You know, he's, he's so honest on the air that you kind of know everything already. Uh, there's probably nothing that I that, uh, I could say that would surprise anybody, but uh, he's just an awesome boss to work for. You know, really nice guy, and I'm, I'm very, very fortunate to have this job and for, to, you know, for, to have been there for so long now. So, uh, yeah, he's just a super nice, down-to-earth guy. I also wanted to ask you about when you had a guest appearance on Metalocalypse. How did that come about? Uh, that was um, one of their writers, Tommy uh, Blocka, uh, contacted me, and he knew me just from the metal band that I played in, and uh, asked if I wanted to do, to do a voice, and I was like, hell yeah, because I love that show. I was a big fan, and uh, it's such an honor that I got to do it, and uh I wish that show was still going on because that it was like the perfect show, you know, being a metal fan and also loving cartoons. Uh, it really was, and then the music was incredible on that show. I got to see them on tour, and uh, 
they were just amazing that Gene Hoagland was playing drums for them. It was awesome. So, uh, you know, it was just uh, Tommy contacted me on MySpace back in the day and said, hey, you want to do a voice for a cartoon? I was like, hell yeah. <laughs> this is going to be a weird question, but I had people submit their own questions for you. Um, someone asked about wearing adult diapers during shows. How did you get the idea, and is it more common than people think? <laughs> uh, I don't know that it's that common. I haven't seen anybody else doing it besides me, but you know where it came from is uh, in the year 2000, when I was playing drums for Demons and Wizards, we opened up for Iron Maiden at the Gods of Metal Festival in Milan, Italy. And I got the chance, after we played, to go watch Iron Maiden at the uh, soundboard. And they had scaffolding above the soundboard, and they let me climb up the scaffolding and stand right above the soundboard where the sound was perfect and where I had a perfect view of the stage. And the only problem was halfway through their set, I had to pee, and I would have had to wade through the whole crowd of 20,000 people to go backstage to go to the bathrooms, and I probably would have missed about five songs. So I was like, well, why don't I just pee my pants? I don't have to miss any of Iron Maiden's songs. <laughs> and, but the only problem was I was afraid it was going to leak onto the soundboard and, uh, and short out the soundboard. So I had to cross my legs and let it all soak into my jeans. And from then on, I was like, well, that's, if I'm going to you know, be that hardcore and not want to miss any band songs, I might as well just wear a diaper to show. And, uh, and it works. You know, there's, there's only a few bands that, that don't have songs. You know, so certain bands have songs where you can go to the bathroom, but there's a lot of bands that I love that I love every one of their songs. And Iron Maiden is one of them. Coheed and Cambria is one of them. Uh, Striper is one of them. And, and they're those bands that where there's there's no songs where I can go to the bathroom because I love every song. <laughs> so I just wear a diaper. Will you be catching Striper on the upcoming To Hell with the Devil anniversary tour? Absolutely. I'm so psyched. I actually just did another interview and Michael Sweet surprised me by being on the phone and it like totally blew my mind. It was awesome. So, uh, yeah, I can't freaking wait. That That's one of those albums that changed my life. And uh, uh, there's a few songs off that album that I've never got to see them do live. So I'm already planning on I'm going to be at the New Jersey show and the New York City show and I can't freaking wait. I wanted to ask you if you listen to any newer metal bands at all. Yeah, a ton of them. Um, you know, a lot of the Metal Blade bands I love, like Battlecross and, uh, and um, you know, Whitechapel. And there's a, Metal Blade has so many killer bands. And, uh, yeah, a lot of young bands. I love the um, a lot of the younger 80s thrash type bands that are coming out now, too. Uh, and there's a lot of older bands that have new albums out that I'm freaking out on, like uh, Amon Amar, their new album, I think, is a masterpiece. Uh, Yom's like, and, and, uh, and the band Coheed and Cambria, their new album's incredible. So, I'm trying to keep up as much as I can. There's uh, a new band called Survive that I freaking love. They did the soundtrack for this TV show called Stranger Things on Netflix, mm. and I've just been listening to them nonstop, and, uh, I got, you know, I bought the uh, the two albums, the soundtrack for Stranger Things on iTunes, and I can't stop listening to it. I'm going to order it on vinyl as soon as it comes out as well. And also, Survive has an album coming out on Relapse at the end of September that I can't freaking wait for. So, yeah, I'm trying to, trying to keep up with new stuff as much as I can, definitely. I wanted to ask, what are the future plans for Chard Walls of the Damned or any other musical projects you might have or maybe even non-musical projects uh well you know we're hoping to do uh some festival shows maybe a little bit of touring if our schedules allow for this album um i'm playing uh on a on a new album by monty Pittman, who, who it also comes out on metal blade actually on the same day as the chard walls album so um i'm really excited about that Billy Sheehan is on bass, which is amazing. I'm a big fan of his, so that was an honor. And then uh, there's an event um, called the Great jack o lantern Blaze in upstate New York, and I write the music for that every year. It's a halloween theme event where you walk through like 5,000 pumpkins. And 
uh, it's really cool because I get to write John Carpenter type synthesizer music to it. So if you go on iTunes and type in Blaze the soundtrack, uh, it'll come up and it's real cool, you know, Halloween type uh, synthesizer music. So that's a lot of fun. So I got that coming up too. So trying to stay busy and uh, I'm just, you know, I'm hoping everybody uh, loves this new Charles Walls album. Do you have anything else you, you want to say to anybody who might be listening to this? Um, just that I hope you bang your head to the new Charlie Walls of the Band album. It comes out September 23rd and on Metal Blade Records. And uh, it also comes out on vinyl, I think, a little bit after that date. So if you love vinyl, it's going to be out on vinyl. And uh, just thanks for uh, wanting to hear Charlie Walls of the Band. And, and thank you for interviewing me. I really appreciate all the, the nice words. And it was awesome talking to you.